my guest today is Erwin Finkel, and he's quite a legend, and he's working currently at the British Museum, and we are going to talk about games in antiquity today, which I'm quite excited for. And as I was watching, you know, this was recorded before the pandemic, I think, and he was playing with Tom Scott, which is quite a sort of famous YouTuber, I guess you should say, and uh, you're mm -hmm. playing the Royal Game of Earth, which caught my attention, and we're going to discuss it shortly. But uh, how, how, as I always asked, how did you get into the world of gaming and ancient gaming, in specifically in board games, etc.? Well, it's, it's a very simple question to answer because when I was still at school, um, in those days, we used to go regularly to the public library and get books out to read them. And I came from that sort of family. And once I got a book out of the library by a man called R.C. Bell or Robbie Bell, and he wrote a book called Board and Table Games of Many Civilizations. And it was a book for the general public. And I didn't know much about it until I started to read it. But the thing is, all my life I've been going to the British Museum even before I worked there. And I always knew about the Royal Game of Ur, which you mentioned, because it was an important exhibit. And when I got this book home, I discovered that the author had written about this game and other ancient games. And I was absolutely riveted. So I read this book many times. And in fact, when I was a little older, about 14, I wrote to the author, Mr. Bell, and he invited me to go to his house wow. in Newcastle and so I did got on the train and all the way to Newcastle and he had a huge collection of board games and he and his wife were very very welcoming and he showed me his entire collection which had ancient things and medieval and Victorian and modern games board games of all kinds I'd never seen anything like it and he also had an interesting idea that when you didn't have an example of an ancient game because you couldn't normally find such things he would make replicas he had a, a lathe to turn to make things like that and he so he did that as well so he wrote many books as a matter of fact and his interest was to tell people about the ancient games what we know about them and how they might have been played and he had a big effect on me and um, I've always been interested ever since in that topic. So when I got the job in the British Museum, which was in 1979, I was employed there to read cuneiform inscriptions because I work in the Department of the Middle East where um, we have ancient writing, cuneiform writing from the Sumerians and the Babylonians. And that was my life's work. But I discovered that we not only had the, the, the game of, or in the museum, of course, one of them, but also I found a tablet in the department with rules on which turned out to be for this game. So I had a kind of double strand of the interest in ancient games and my work as a cuneiform person, and they suddenly dovetailed into one to work on this matter. Doesn't so get I, better, does it? It doesn't happen very often. And so I got interested in all the games that we know about before chess and backgammon, because they are also ancient from the beginning of the first millennium BC. They're very ancient games themselves, but everybody knows about backgammon. Lots of people play it, and the same with chess. And the research that needs to be done on those games is rather different from archaeological and ancient research on really ancient games. So I do quite a lot of that and have met good people, good friends who are also interested. So there's a kind of brotherhood of maybe 40 or 50 people who are now interested in this kind of thing. Of course, we're going to begin with what with a video that I saw, which I highly recommend watching. It's on it's on the British Museum YouTube page currently, and it's it should be easy enough to find. And that was the Royal Game of Ur. And I, we talked briefly about this before we started recording. And it's yeah. and this kind of reminds me a little bit of Ludo. Is that fair to say that it's kind of similar in a sense to Ludo? Well, you in some respects it is because the board is made of squares laid out in a pattern. But if you think of Ludo, um, Ludo is for four players and uh, the board on which you play is a kind of cross. So it goes north to south and west to east. I mean, it's not just that, but because in Ludo as well, when you jump on one brick, it being sent back and in 
in oh, the Royal yeah. Game of Earth as well. You do it kind of when you jump on a brick. Well, you do have safe zones as well in Nudo. So it's kind of, that's the, how it kind of reminded me well, a little it, bit I of understand. the game. It, it does remind one, but the, 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 the idea that in a race game, that you, you're on a square and someone can knock you off applies to many race games. It's a kind of characteristic because all the games, as far as I know, really, before backgammon and or before chess were race games when you have a board of one kind or another, one design or another, and usually for two players, and you race round the track, like in Ludo, uh, try to get home first and knock off your opponent when you get the chance. So that is the basic pattern of board games before chess. So um, the Royal Game of Ur is a very ancient one because we know of it from about 3000 BC already. And it was played in the Indus Valley. There are sites like Dolivera and so forth, where from 2800 or so boards have been found and early boards in Persia and early boards in ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Iraq. So what is an interesting thing and something really worth stating clearly is that um, as far as we can see the, the game of the royal game of Ur that you were talking about almost certainly began in India, almost certainly, and it spread through Persia into the Middle East. And from the Middle East, it went all round the known world. And in a way, it is like what happened with chess all that time later, because that started in India, and that went through Persia into the Middle East, and that went round the world. So it's a rather funny parallel. But the thing about the Royal Game of Ur, if you watch this uh, video or even part of it, you soon get the idea because you, throw your pieces, you, throw, you roll the dice, yeah. you throw it on the table, and you get the throws that you want, and sometimes you get the right one, and sometimes you get the wrong one, and it's very exciting. And it was rather you know, intense when I was watching it, yes. kind of like, oh, come on. That's exactly right, and I'll tell you something, that there was no rehearsal, and mm. we just did it, we just sat down, mm. and my idea was to try and make Tom Scott, who's a very famous person on the internet, to make him cross so I pretended I didn't know who he was and I made all sorts of sarcastic remarks. Yeah. We, had, we had a good time with it. But the thing is this, the most important thing is this, that we know of this game from archaeology from about 3000 BC. And it lasted until about the first century AD. That's 3000 years. And all the countries of the Middle Eastern world all played this game. Like, for example, the Pharaoh Tutankhamun very famous wow. person as well when they excavated his tomb there were several game boards which had this design on so it was a very popular um, game and i think it's easy to understand because one of the things is when you play it according as we understand it it doesn't take all day you know with modern games like war games yeah. Students might play on the floor for four days and mm. never eat or drink anything until they win. It's nothing like that. It's a just can't take a good game of Monopoly, for example. It can take the whole the whole of a Christmas holiday. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But but this game, you know, you play for twenty minutes and somebody's won, and you might have another game. But it's good because you never know who is going to win, and it's got this quality, which I think is one of the reasons why it lasted so long. Because that's what people have always liked in board games, something which is fair. So there's no favoritism and you both have luck. You both have a bit of skill and the best man wins this sort of idea. And that characterizes all these ancient games. Does it matter if you got the experience already that, that you play this game? You play this game loads of time, I assume. But does it matter that you got experience or is it purely well, luck? Well, it's like this. It's it's mostly luck. But the question is this. You have five pieces or sometimes seven pieces, depending, which you have to get on the board and all round the track to the end before your opponent. So the thing is, the actual throws are lucky. But the um, how you use them involves a certain amount of wisdom. So if you play in a risky fashion or you play in a careful, sedate fashion, then you have some control over your fate. So it, it's, it's not just a silly game 
with luck, like, for example, the game of snakes and ladders with oh. children, because you know if you're an, and i always say this if you're an adult like an uncle or a father and you play snakes and ladders with a child the only interesting thing is letting the child win yeah. when it doesn't realize it because the game itself is really boring because it's just rolling the dice and moving the pieces mm -hmm. so the thing about the game from ur and which is why it's spread over the world the ancient world so thoroughly is because it had an enough skill element in it that it, you felt you were can in control of your pieces it was much more satisfactory and as i understood as well that's one of the first manual instructions that was written that's yes. still that's that is available in the british museum as as we speak i believe yes it's a clay tablet written in the babylonian writing in the second century bc and it's rather interesting for this reason because when that tablet was written, it was the work of a quite famous Babylonian astronomer. He was a member of a family of ancient scientists. His father and grandfather before him were astronomers. And this is the thing. They knew the game played in a rather simple form, which had been played forever and ever. But in the late period, there were some different rules introduced. And this interested this astronomer because the board had gone through a slight change of shape, which meant that there were 12 squares up the middle. And instead of having eight squares and then going round left and right, the final block at the end, they moved them. So you had 12 squares up the middle. Now, this is to an astronomer an irresistible thing because it's to do with the movements of the planets, the zodiac things through the heavens, as well as a board game. So he wrote this tablet with all about the game, with all this extra stuff in it, and it's very complicated. But the most important thing about this tablet, which one day I hope you will see in the British Museum, is this, that it turns out that the pieces in the game, of which there were five, were all different one to the other. Because normally in, in the ancient game from Ur itself, they were like pawns in a chess set. They all had the same significance and value. But at the end of its history, there'd been a change where the five pieces were all different and they all had to have their own score to get on the board. So this is a very interesting thing in the history of board games, because otherwise it's only chess where you have your pieces on your side and they all have different powers. And it's the same sort of idea. But in chess, of course, there were no dice. It wasn't a dice game. So I'm telling you all this in a great rush and there's lots of other things too about these ancient games but the fact is that it is really a very newish kind of field because of this scholars who work on ancient things are very used to this rule that you you get interested in a certain topic you collect what you can find out from dig reports from photographs from talking to colleagues and you get the evidence all together and then you sit down and you think well if this is what we have maybe it works like this maybe it works like that and you make a sort of model yeah the point about the model the dangerous point is that all you can do is the best you can do now what actually happens in the science of archaeology is just when you think you've got everything nicely worked out with a rational solution mm. somebody digs up something in another yeah. excavation and everything goes out the window so this is um, um in some ways terrifying but it's also very exciting because it means that you always have to rethink and rethink so that happens also with ancient games because some of them there are very few of them and every time a new one comes to light goodness me you have to start thinking all over again right so how, how did this game spread, as you assume it came from India, so how did it spread and become so popular in, in the a, ancient world? A very important question, and I think it works like this. The basic situation is that human beings have a hunger for good games, and they always have had such a hunger. So there is, so to speak, a market and the reason is this that in many parts of the world 
there are times of the day when it is too hot to do anything. And this applies in the Middle East. There's a reason why the Spanish have siesta. That's precisely that fact. Yes. And board games fit ideally into this kind of situation. So you have people who are all over the place, hungry for a good game to play and every reason to want to play one. So that is the background. Then the second point is that when somebody invents a good game, it goes like bilio. It will spread like mad because of this hunger. And because many games that people invent are no good and they disappear and they fall away. And if you have a really good game, everybody will like it. So that's another factor which affects it. So I mean, there's, you, there's a, again to mention, and again, there is a reason why Monopoly and the risk game of risk, risk just stuck around for so long. And there are so many variations that's of these exactly games. Right. Yes, that's exactly right. But you see, you asked me originally about how they spread. Mm. Well, the thing is, if you conceive of this appetite um, being a functional principle that people everywhere will be interested in such a thing, games tend to be spread by merchants or sometimes by mercenaries or by travelers, people who go from country to country. So you imagine, for example, um, it, um, somebody from um, India um, goes a long way on a trading mission and ends up in somewhere in Persia and meets some people. They go for a drink in an early example of a bar and they sit around and people say, have you ever seen this? And they play. And the guy goes, no, that's amazing. Show me how it goes. And even if you have two players who don't have a shared language, the way it works is if you watch a game being played, if you have any kind of brains in your head and it's not complicated, then you learn it from this way. So wherever you have movement of people and interaction of people, this is one of the things that spreads. And um, when it arrives somewhere, this is what happens. People are very interested and maybe the person who brought it can't quite remember all the rules sometimes this happens you know they have an idea of the board and they did this and i can't remember that so what happens is that locally people will experiment until they find something which is good using the same board and design and type yeah. of game so then you get as you say variants which will spring up and take root and sometimes be even stronger so you have to think of it like this i once had this idea you know that if you're in the kitchen and you drop a bottle of milk on the floor, then the milk goes everywhere, yeah. under the fridge, under the cupboard. It's an incredibly annoying thing. Well, this is what happens with board games. When a really good game comes into the world, it just spreads and nothing can stop it. Because in the history of games, there have been times when, for example, the church has tried to outlaw chess the taliban outlawed chess and people tried to uh, in cuba and it was illegal to play monopoly people sometimes for various reasons say this game is not allowed and anybody playing it will have their hand cut off the very it's foundation of capitalism it. yes but it yeah it was uh, actually Mm. Um, Monopoly is a marvelous example of um, how to make innocent children into wicked capitalists. <laughs> I know the feeling myself when you land on the blue little blue, blue the, the yeah. biggest one, and you get to finally get a hotel there. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, we got other games as well, of course. The Royal Game of Ur was the only game in antiquity, and not especially dice games were popular in the Roman world, and people would use them jungle on dice games, so even though it was a thrown up and not exactly illegal, but people did it anyway. So what kind of dice games do we have if you can talk a little about? about well, that? well, in ancient Egypt and ancient Babylonia, um, dice are found, but they're usually only found in conjunction with the games played on a board. Mm. Now, I'm quite sure that people play dice games in the market, gambling for their lunch or for drinks or things like that, just trick lucky games like that but we don't have any information about it mm. but you can be certain that when you have dice which are used for one purpose like a proper board game they were also used for gambling mm. and and this is a human activity and i'm quite sure you're right so we know about the the, the romans they also played board games but they also gambled a lot and uh, in the middle ages 
um, that one of the things that they tried to outlaw. They said that dice were the work of the devil and they should be stamped out from society and things like that. I mean, was gambling frowned upon in the ancient world, with, especially with dice and board games? Did people do this often? No, I think uh, games were regarded as a perfectly normal, healthy thing, and nobody ever tried to outlaw games in antiquity. And whether they played dice games, as I say, we can't prove it, but we can be sure they did play dice games. But there's no, um, you don't find people saying they're immoral and wrong and trying to stop them. There is um, uh, one small piece of evidence from Babylonia, which might be to do with gambling, because when they went to school to learn to write on their tablets, they sometimes wrote quotations from literary texts. So every day in the classroom, you had to write an extract from this composition and that composition, and then the teacher would look at it. And we have one of these uh, school tablets, only one from about 600 BC, where the line goes, woe is me, woe is me, oh my astragal, oh my astragal. And that's all there is. So it sounds like somebody who'd been using knuckle bones and gambling had lost everything and they were lamenting and lamenting, but we've only got the first line of what was probably a long piece of literature. But it's a kind of clue, is it not? Yeah, it is. So what, what other games do we have in antiquity that you would like to share with us that was rather popular, as, if not more, even more popular than the royal game of uh, we should talk about? Well, I'm not sure that there's a, a real rival. Um, there's a peculiar game which was played in ancient Egypt, which was called Senet, S-E-N-E-T. And this game of Senet was also played on a, uh, on a, a box, and the board was three squares by ten squares. So you have 30 squares. Yeah. And they also had dice. But this was a quite different game from the royal game of Ur, because when you played your opponent, you set up your pieces um, all along one edge and halfway up the middle. Alternately, so a red one, a yellow one, a, I mean, a, a green one and a yellow one and a green one and a yellow one. So there were 10 along the edge and then halfway up the middle. And then you threw the dice and you had to move your pieces along, shuffling them along when there was a space. Now, this board game, we don't know exactly how it was played, but Egyptologists have done a lot of work on it because there are paintings of it in, 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 um, in play and what have you. And the result seems to be that it's rather boring. Oh. And the interesting thing is that this game was only played in Egypt. So the other board games that we have tended to go from place to place that like we were talking before, popular wherever you went, but this Senate is only played in Egypt. Mm. And I have a feeling that the reason was that nobody else wanted to play it. Mm. So why, what, do you have an idea why this was so popular in Egypt and nowhere else? Yes, I do. Um, because uh, it was a very ancient game from the time of the first dynasty. And um, at a certain point in the, what they call the New Kingdom from about 1500 BC, there was a version of this game played, which was much more complicated, which was something to do with the netherworld. Because when you died in Egypt and went down to hell, you had to play this game against some guardian deity. And if you won, then you would have go into some kind of heaven situation. And if you lost, it was the opposite. So this... Um, there was a lot of attention played to this game and some, some examples are known where every square of the board has writing on it in hieroglyphic writing about the significance of the square and there's even a papyrus about it. So one of the reasons why it survived was it moved from being a, a, a simple, not particularly exciting game played by everybody to this specialised thing to do with funerary belief. And for that reason, it survived, and uh, uh, I think especially well. So it's a mystery, really. There's one other game which is a bit it will certainly worth mentioning. Yeah. And it's called the game of 58 holes. And you have a little board with, you're often made of ivory, with a tree in the middle. And you have, a, you know what a cribbage board looks like? You know, a cribbage with, when you have. Can't a track. imagine it right now. No. Okay, well, when you have a board, uh, when you, uh, 
with a chessboard, you have squares. Yeah. Okay. But with a board like the modern game of cribbage or the ancient game of 58 holes, the track was marked out with holes mm. and the pieces stuck in the holes. They were like little pointy. Mm. Oh, I think it's the one right. where you jump over and you're going to get that's, one of those yeah. bits out. That's the sort of oh, thing. Yeah. Yes. So this game, um, th th there were 29 holes on one, one edge and 29 on the other. And people played this game, um, not only in Egypt, but in many other places as well. So this was a popular game. But one of the interesting things is this, that all the boards are rather small and they're designed for small hands. And I have an idea that the game of 58 holes um, is a game that was played by women. And that the game of 20 squares, uh, or the war game, of, uh, was played by men. And well, what was what? Yeah, what was the reason for the, this diversity? Well, the reason for this, um, the reason I think it might be the case, is that in India, where um, board games are a very healthy and important thing to this day, there are games that are played by men, and there are games that are played by women, and there's no crossover. And this may only be true of India. But my own idea is that it was something which um, is an ancient matter and also applied in the ancient Middle Eastern world. Because, as I say, there's a very famous board for this 58 holes on little legs ma made in Thebes, which is in the Metropolitan Museum today in about 1500. And it's incredibly delicate. And the pieces are very spindly. It looks like it's made in 18th century mm. France. It's a very lovely object. Now, when you play the game of Ur, it, one of the things I didn't mention before is that when the pieces became different, there was another thing as well, because they had bets on the game as they played it. And the bets were for drink and food and women. So the phraseology belongs in a bar where people got raucous and they got drunk and they got violent. And this game with its um, bets and all that kind of thing is the sort of thing you can readily imagine from um, later life, the later world. But at the same time, no classy woman is ever going to play the game of Ur where they're going to win or lose women. It stands to reason it's a men's game. Mm. So I think this is a possibly working thing and um, can't yet be proved. But this is one of the, what I was talking about. You have a theory and maybe one day there'll be some proof. For example, it will be possible to find a letter in Egyptian or in Babylonian or some other language where two women are talking about this game. Then, then we would know. But so far, such evidence has not come to light. What made it so popular to gamble on these board games in general? That, that made it, was it the excitement? Was it kind of like going to a horse race in, in the 19th century? Kind of that kind of thing that made it so exciting to gamble on board games? Well, I don't know. Um, I think the excitement, um, it, it depends on the question of stakes and seriousness. Because you can have a perfectly friendly um, small stake gambling games played between people just for fun and amusement, which does not culminate necessarily in violence or ferocity. But the kind of gambling that one talks about today, which is an addiction and is sometimes classified as an addiction side by side with alcoholism and drug addiction and things like that, where a person is in the grip of the uh, of the gambling mechanism and can't escape, where the adrenaline rush is, is, is produced by betting much more money than you have and whether you're going to win or not is a whole different thing. It's yeah. possible that there were such things in antiquity, but we just don't have any evidence. I don't think mm. it's very likely because um, gambling like that is perhaps dependent upon money and wealth in the form of coinage, because um, before the existence of coins, the, the balance of possessions and, and things was based on a kind of exchange system against silver and often people paid in kind and all that kind of thing and I suppose you could bet 20 sheep and lose the sheep but so somehow the the modern picture of the gambler in a casino or someone like that I think is a bit um, is a bit anomalous a bit out of 
keeping to read that back into antiquity without any evidence of course you never know you never know because the most important thing about all this kind of discussion all this stuff to do with the ancient world is that human beings are the same today as they were in antiquity and you could say on those grounds well perhaps there were lots of people who played dice all the time and they gave away all their housing and i think in classical sources in latin and greek there's plenty of evidence for it so maybe also in egypt and mesopotamia so you mentioned you mentioned a few but then we have another babylonian games that may not be as famous as the royal game of Ur or anything anything you actually might enlighten us with well um the one thing i can enlighten you with in a way is this that um, in the university of jena they have a big collection of cuneiform inscriptions and one of them is a hymn a, a, it's a religious poem addressed to the goddess inanna and inanna or ishtar as she's called um was the goddess of love and war and it's clear from literary references in in um, compositions that inanna or ishtar was in charge of games and in this text there's a list of all the games played by boys and all the games played by girls and there's about 35 of each so this ought to answer your question perfectly because we have a list of them specially written out for us where we can see what they did the trouble is that about three quarters of the words for these games which are on this tablet we don't know what they mean oh, and have, because, haven't we been able to decipher the language yet well we can decipher the language we, 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 we see we can read the babylonian language because it is semitic it is like arabic and hebrew and that family and in the 19th century when they first found a bilingual and they started to investigate they we now can read the babylonian language like we can read english or probably norwegian in certain people's mm -hmm. cases but in a language you have common words rare words and sometimes unique words and we know a lot about the babylonian tongue we know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of words and we know all about the grammar and everything but sometimes a word comes up which is never known been known before and we don't know what it means and it turns out that the names of these games are like that and that's not surprising because if you think when you were in the playground when you were a boy the names that people gave to playground games um, and they still do in the modern world are not normal words you have names like housey housey and hodgy podgy and all those sorts of tug of war and sometimes rude words and um things like that and it's clear from these these pieces of vocabulary that they are games and some of them are to do with um wind and blowing noisily and some of them are to do with setting people on fire and things like that but that's lovely we don't know yes i, I know I, I don't think i've ever tried that myself it may be <laughs> but i've never done it. i don't know if that's such a good idea to be honest well i don't think it should be encouraged at home but the, the thing is uh it's, it's an ironic thing that you, we we know the names of all so we can't identify any of them except some of them are skipping rope type games and there are some words for dice for knuckle bones so they did have as, as we know already but they had knuckle bone dice and they played dice games but it's just the names of them and and some of them are very obscure indeed I, I was reading a while ago, I, I'm going to try to say his last name, his Polish last name, uh, Babylon. He, he wrote Babylon, the book, Paul, I'm going to try to say it here, Paul Krivacic, I, I don't Yeah. And he's, where he said that Babylon was the one who invented the writing system, that the, the writing system first appeared in Babylon. Is that correct? It is. Well, in Mesopotamia, yeah. because... Um, uh, the, the writings the oldest writing we know from archaeology this is we don't know for certain it's the oldest writing but what we know from archaeology is that the first kind of writing which was the sort of picture writing appeared in ancient mesopotamia in about 4000 bc 
and the pictures they they developed in such a way that people realized that you could do a picture of something not for um what it looked like but the sound of the word and when they had this idea they realized that they could use these signs to spell the sounds of words and when they did that when this idea came then the script rapidly developed into syllables where you could write anything down and it became a proper proper language so from about 2800 we have text written that we can read as if we could speak to the people themselves it is extraordinary and that is as far as we know uh, the way the writing started and developed but also it we think it's the oldest or it's the oldest we know of sometimes egyptologists say oh no no um e egyptian writing is older but don't believe this it is not true you see the first evidence for egyptian writing the whole system is there in one go and with our material um much much older we have things a bit like writing we have early attempts at writing different things that started and stopped so we can see through our sort of binoculars that there were experimental phases until the system matured into a proper system so it's more likely that the writing of mesopotamia was imitated by the egyptians than the other way around and of course egyptian writing is very beautiful and um it, you know it's very romantic and everybody loves it but the way it works is not dissimilar from cuneiform in the way they do the sound writing i mean it's inc it's incredible to me how not only does writing systems arrive and language kind of like it's more it's more dead now but the kind of like that it survives to this day that you have an idea of what it's spoke like and how yes. they, how how this games is games in general is still in love even though we don't like computer games and video games and we still love a you know, board game or card game or dice game mm -hmm. to this day that it's it's still around with us and it's some of has arrived from two to three five thousand years ago it's it is it, incredible to me it is incredible to me it's, it's a very remarkable thing and the more you think about it the more interesting it is uh, one other thing you asked me at the beginning yeah. about this game ludo which is a a parlor game that people play with children and you have four arms do you not in a kind of cross yeah. and you, you have your pieces and dice and you go around to the middle well that game comes from india because um, we have evidence from um, uh, uh, the 17th century and um, um and there on and it's still played in india and they like to play on this cross which is made of textile so not wood like a chessboard or material of this kind, but they have embroidered cloth with the squares on. And it's a really complicated game because um, this, the dice are used. Well, they try to say it does, it's a kind of a brother sister game to the Royal Game of Earth in a sense. No, it's a separate thing. And well, I tell you, I know this is a good question, but the thing is, this game is for four players. Mm. The Indian game is called Pachisi or chopper and it's for four players and that is the game which in the 19th century came to britain because of the families um, in india they had their children looked after by uh, ayahs who were usually indians and they taught the children to play this game there and when they came back to england the game came with them and it turned into ludo which is a simpler version of it and then ludo has got all around the world there's nowhere where people don't play ludo or something like it yeah. but um the the, the um, what did you ask me you asked me something else in the middle I, i'm honestly not sure I, the, but I, I think it, i think it was uh if it was kind of sister brother game to the royal game of Earth, right. if it was it's because it's kind of not too far of it's from, not too far but the thing is, the Royal Game of Ur was definitely played by two people. And actually, in the history of the world, um, most board games are for two people. So you fight against somebody or you strive against somebody or whatever. And it's A against B. And the thing about this Ludo game is it's for four players. And very probably, very probably, it started out as a two-player game which might well mean that it was connected with the indian version 
of the Royal Game of Ur. And then somebody had the idea, why don't we double it? And so more people can play that sort of idea. So it may in fact be related, yeah. So is it kind of that more, just mentioned that it was usually just two player games, but mm. is it more recently that it's been, four games kind of been developed yes. to play with more players? Is that a recent thing? It's a very recent thing. It's a very recent thing. And in fact, traditionally, this game of Parcisi, or what was Ludo, is the only well, traditional game that was played by four players. In fact, I have a theory that one of the reasons that card games became so popular is that many card games are for four people, or even more sometimes, whereas most board games, you couldn't do it. And maybe... The, the, the way that card games became so popular and so widespread was that it offered an entertainment for more than two players. I think that might be true, but you can't prove that either. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure to have you on well, the podcast. I'm glad to meet you in this funny way. I'm very glad to meet you. I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with so much. And uh, do, before you go, do you have anything you wish to promote? Anything where people might find you if they have any questions about games yes. and anything where people might buy your books? Well, that would be lovely. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's always a good idea. I've just written a new book called The First Ghosts, which is all about um, the, the Babylonians' um, idea of ghosts and why they come back and where they're supposed to be and how to get rid of them and how to make them happy. And uh, we know all about it uh, all that time ago. We know as much about it as you can imagine. So I wrote a whole book about it called The First Ghost. That, yeah, one day we should do a program about ghosts. Oh, right, definitely, definitely. Very, very interesting. And that's something when people will ask questions, believe me. Anyway, and I'm very mm -hmm. glad to be here. And when you come to London, whenever that will be, absolutely. You'll see me in the British Museum. Absolutely. Okay. We'll do a live episode there. Thank you so Love. much for listening. Thing. This has been with that as well. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find us. Please consider if you like this episode, check out some more of our podcast. We have some fascinating guests and some fascinating topics. And please leave us a review on iTunes if you've got an iPhone. It will be, be most helpful. Please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. Bravo. Bye bye.